Hello, everybody. I am uh, Azita Talegani, Professor of Persian Language, Literature and Linguistic in the University of Toronto. I welcome you to another inspiring monthly Elohe Omid Yarmi Jalali Institute of Iranian Studies visual lecture series on Persian language pedagogy, new trends and innovations, which is jointly organized by the University of Toronto and University of Chicago. I am co-convening this lecture series with my colleague, Professor Pune Shabani Jadidi from the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilization at the University of Chicago. We have another lecture series, which will be in fall 2023. You will um, uh, soon receive the flyer and posters of these lecture series. We are grateful for the support of the Elohe Omid Yarmir Jalali Institute of Iranian Studies and its director, Professor Muhammad Tavakoli Tarvi, and all the sponsoring academic units, University of Toronto Faculty uh, Art and Science, Department of Near uh, um, um, and Middle Eastern Civilizations, Department of Near Eastern uh, Languages and Civilizations, Division of the U Humanities, as well as the Center of Middle Eastern Studies of the University of Chicago, Iran Nomak, a quarterly of the Canadian Society of Iranian Studies, and Russian Cultural Heritage Institute. At the outset, I like to express our collective gratitude to Canada's indigenous people and acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississauga of Credit River. Today, this meeting place continues to be the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work, to teach, and to learn, prosper under uh, ancestral uh, homeland. I'd like to welcome Dr. Masoud Jospi from University of California, Davis, to the University of Toronto, and to our lecture series. Professor Jospi is Assistant Professor of Linguistic in the Department of Linguistic at the University of California, Davis. His main, uh, main area of research includes language acquisition, semantics, pragmatics, psycholinguistics, computational, and experimental methods in linguistics. Professor Jospi has uh, written several articles on linguistics and presented a number of papers at conferences. His recent article, The Meaning of the Persian Object Marker Raw, uh, what it is not and what it probably is, uh, published by John Benjamin as a chapter in the monograph on advances of Iranian linguistic in 2020. My friend and colleague, Professor Pune Shabani Jadidi, will moderate today's session on leaky grammar and language pedagogy. We will appreciate if you save and keep your question for end of the uh, lecture, and please uh, join me to welcome Professor Jaspi to our uh, Persian Second Language Pedagogy Lecture Series. Professor J uh, Jaspi, welcome. Thank you so much, um, Azdajan and Punajan, and everyone for coming to the talk on a Saturday at noon. Uh, I um, thought of keeping the talk um, a little bit light, so I thought leaky grammars would be a good topic to discuss. Um, I Before I jump into the talk, I wanted to um, have a disclaimer that my general background is in first language acquisition in semantics and pragmatics and computational methods. Um, this is a new, let's say, direction um, that um, my student Fatima and I are uh, taking. And Fatima has more experience um, in Persian language pedagogy. And um, today, what I thought would be good to do is to share some, some thoughts from someone with um, less background in language pedagogy with people who are experts in this field and see what your comments are on these thoughts. Um, so um, as you know, the title is Leaky Grammars and Language Pedagogy. And um, I'm going to start with just the main argument and throughout, throughout the talk, just elaborate on this argument. Um, the first, let's say, premise of the argument or the first statement is that all grammars and grammatical generalizations leak, which means they have errors and irregularities. 
Um, errors and irre irregularities are two sides of the coin. We're going to talk about that next. Um, language pedagogy that relies on explicit grammar instruction can introduce errors and biases to the learner and negatively affect the learning process. This is just the possibility, let's say a probability that this happens. Um, the question is, how much does that happen? And um, in order to minimize the errors that the explicit uh, uh, presentation of grammar can introduce, I can think of two ways. Um, one is to increase the representativeness and informativity of the learning data that we present to the students or to the learners and rely more on implicit learning. Um, as you might have noticed, I'm walking right into the implicit explicit debate, but uh, hopefully uh, um, coming out with uh, having uh, understood it better and uh, shedding more light on the debate. And second, continuously update instructional grammars to reflect the most accurate accounts available at the time. Um, what I'm trying, I'm going to argue at the end is that both of these require collaborations among th theoretical linguists and second language acquisition researchers more than there have been before and more, especially more systematically. I think there have been uh, collaborations, uh, but I think the ties are not it's more like individual effort of researchers and particular conferences to make that happen rather than, um, let's say, systematic link. So this is the outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about leaky grammars. I'm going to talk about language learning and pedagogy, then talk about how leaky grammars relate to pedagogy, um, talk about some case studies of leaky grammatical generalizations in Persian, um, and then finally some possible solutions. Um, first, leaky grammars. Um, this expression comes from Edward Sapir's language book, and here is the full, um, let's say, quote, uh, in order to shed light on what he really meant, at least he meant by leaky grammar, um, generations of linguists have used it differently since him. Uh, so he says, the randomness of the expression of plurality in such words as books, ox and sheep and geese is felt to be rather more, I fancy, an unavoidable and traditional predicament than a, than a welcome luxuriance. I didn't know luxuriance as a word, but it seems like it was at that time. It is obvious that a language cannot go beyond a certain point in this randomness. Uh, many languages go incredibly far in this respect, it is true, but linguistic history shows conclusively that sooner or later, the less frequently occurring associations are ironed out at the expense of the more vital ones. In other words, all languages have an inherent tendency to economy of expression, and that's what he means by grammar. Uh, where this tendency entirely inoperative, there would be no grammar. The fact of grammar, a universal trait of language, is simply a generalized expression of the feeling that analogous concepts and relations are most conveniently symbolized in analogous forms. Where a language ever completely grammatical, it would be a perfect engine of concept Ex conceptual expression, uh, expression. Unfortunately, or luckily, no language is tyrannically consistent, all grammars leak. So in this context, um, there is a different, I mean, if you've heard grammars leak before, you might have heard of it in a it, different context or different meaning of grammar. So there are two different grammars typically uh, in the uh, kind of fam famous expression. The grammar, um, can be uh, first the actual grammar of a language. This is what really Sapir meant. The second one is grammar as a linguistic hypothesis about the structure of a language. And um, um, Sapir really meant that natural languages are in fact somewhat irregular, not that our theories of grammar are incorrect, but future like linguists after him have used the all grammars leak to say that, um, a linguist grammar as a hypothesis about the structure of language is always wrong um, and always has errors. This is understandable because that's the case uh, for any mo scientific model that you build. Um, it's wrong in interesting ways and um, uh, it has errors. So there's no way um, out of that. That's what I mean by leaky grammars. Um, so next, I'm going to make explicit some of the assumptions I have regarding language learning and pedagogy. Um, this is um, partly informed by current research in cognitive science and the way we are thinking of the human mind. And typically, the analogy is that of a machine. 
Um, so what I'm going to talk about next is the basic components of a language learning system. Um, this can be um, the same in humans or machines. So if you're thinking of um, a child or an adult or um, GPT a systems learning language, the same principles apply. Um, they typically have the following basic components. One is the linguistic data. Important to point that I point out that the linguistic data is typically a sample that is presented to the learner. Um, and this sample can have different properties that biases, biases the learning process. Um, the learner's model, so the learner having seen the data builds a model of the phenomenon observed. Different systems build different types of models. And we're trying to figure out what humans build as they get the linguistic data. Um, then there's the learner's linguistic behavior um, that behavior is assessed or evaluate, evaluated um, in terms of when we think of machines, the evaluation would be um, metrics of how far away um, uh, from the target, uh, let's say, production, it, uh, the production of the machine has been. Uh, sometimes it's called the loss function uh, that is used to figure out how much, how erroneous was the production. In a context of a class, typically the teacher might um, point out how erroneous the production was. And finally, um, feedback. Here I'm using feedback as separate from assessment or evaluation, meaning the feedback helps the learner know what it should update in its representations to be able to uh, improve their linguistic capacities or uh, their productions in the future. Uh, in the context of machine learning, this turns into um, uh, calculating the amount of error and then sending back signals to the different parts of the machine to know where things have to be updated, per what parameters have to be changed um, for better performance of the machine. Now, there can't the, the basic version, which is, um, let's say, what we assume kids more or less have, and a lot of the uh, machine learning systems have, is learning without pedagogy. Um, in this type of learning, um, everything um, is on the learner, all the components, there is no teacher, the learner is in charge of all the components. So they gather their own linguistic data, they derive uh, learning generalizations from the data. Um, they have to produce linguistic behavior themselves. So they're kind of probably possibly more limited, and they have to assess their own behavior, and then provide feedback to themselves. Um, there is no one really intervening in the process helping them, um, um, or let's say hinder them, but typically with a pedagogical system, you ex uh, expect helping. Um, then there is learning with pedagogy that is over and above the basic, we can call this implicit, the previous one, implicit learning. And with, in learning with pedagogy, a teacher can intervene in any component here to enhance the learning efficiency. So really the goal is the, the role of a teacher um, let's say mentor, supervisor, call different things in different areas of um, learning theory, is to intervene in one of these components in a way that improves behavior, improves the learning process. So the learner can provide better data. So the data is no longer randomly selected by the learner, but rather uh, someone with better knowledge is handpicking the data that would result in the best learning process. Um, they can directly provide grammatical generalizations. So instead of the learner observing data, which might need a lot of it, in order to arrive at a grammatical generalization, um, the teacher can um, or supervisor can just give them the generalization and say, use it. This is what we're going to focus on for the rest of the talk. The teacher can also elicit linguistic behavior in ways that the learner cannot do on, the, on their own. Um, then they can design targeted assessment for areas that the teacher might think the learner lacks knowledge. So this is more um, sometimes in the machine learning literature called adversarial testing, where um, you are trying to kind of trick uh, the system so that they, the system learns about their um, um, shortcomings. And finally, provide feedback um, to the learner uh, in ways that the learner might not know themselves. So what is going wrong with the system? 
in the learning process, the teacher can provide feedback that the learner cannot have by their own. Um, what I want to say is that I think one, three, four, and five are present in all approaches to pedagogy. Um, I have not seen uh, learning approaches, and this might be due to lack of my lack of knowledge in um, second language acquisition, but I typically it seems like if you go to different types of approaches to language teaching, you have different ways of intervening in one, three, four, and five. What is controversial is two. Do you want to, um, like no one, what I'm saying is no one really thinks that you shouldn't pick the better data for the learner, better examples for your class. If everyone wants to do that, they might disagree on that. Um, for two though, people disagree on whether, some people at least disagree on whether you wanna explicitly provide grammatical generalizations and have grammar lessons or not. Um, so this is the implicit versus explicit grammar instruction debate. Um, there are two approaches, as I said. Implicit approach says, hey, present the data and let the learner derive the generalizations themselves. You shouldn't be teaching grammar. And the explicit approach says, present the grammatical rules explicitly and, and allow the learner to use these explicit teachings to produce linguistic behavior. Um, as far as I know from the literature, um, previous um, studies, uh, sorry, uh, it's a mistake there, studies seem to suggest that uh, the explicit approach is more effective Effective. So there are a lot of studies trying to um, compare these two different approaches. And the conclusion, at least so far, seems to be that the explicit teaching of grammar does have a positive effect in the learning outcome, even though I think there could be more studies to better control uh, different aspects of the, uh, of the teaching scenario to really zero in on how much more the explicit teaching is getting us. However, for the time being, I'm going to assume explicit teaching of grammar is good. I'm personally kind of think I personally think it's probably helping. Um, but if we assume that, um, then uh, the problem of leaky grammars pops up. The issue for teaching grammar and grammatical generalization is exactly that grammar is leak. So regardless of how we actually interpret grammar, whether this is um, the actual grammar of languages versus um, versus our hypotheses being incorrect, explicit instruction of grammar is going to introduce some errors or at least biases. So when you present the grammar, the let's say token-based um, learning can possibly happen less and bias the learner towards more uniform rule-based understanding of the language. Um, the leakier the grammar, um, the more error introduced in the learning, especially with the second sense that I discussed, uh, our hypotheses regarding what each morpheme does or constructions or syntactic, um, let's say, structure um, typically does not capture all that is going on in the language. And this is going to misinform students to some degree. There is no way out of it, but we have to address it at some point. Um, so I'm going to go through three case studies of leaky grammatical generalizations in Persian um, pedagogy. Uh, this is uh, the examples are picked from a, a, a particular book, but um, uh, I want to be clear that it's not about a particular methodology or book, or and even when I suggest, um, as you will see, um, uh, kind of like uh, reducing the leaks, um, the same principle applies to any leak reduction. It's still leaky and you have to improve it. So this is kind of a continuous process. Um, I'm not trying to say that a particular approach is wrong or a particular book, attack a particular book. Um, this is a general problem for language pedagogy that uses theoretical linguistics to teach grammar. So the first, first case is the accusative case in Persian. This is the story of Ra, which is a very, um, let's say, old story, a lot of research on this. Um, this is from a book um, teaching the golden rules for the use of the object marker. Um, the golden rule is um, says that um, Ra is used after a word if all these conditions are met. The word must be the object of the sentence. It must be the direct object of the sentence. It must be definite or specific, not general. Um, one issue that people have pointed to me when I've presented this before is that um, these concepts are not easy to understand. So definite, specific, general, I think for us, it's easy to understand. For students, I, it's, it, it's probably more challenging. But let's assume they get it. Uh, they get what these are. Um, and then four, it must not be preceded by prepositions, the fourth rule. 
let's go through some examples of leaks for case marking. Um, the first one that I want to address is the word must be the direct object of the sentence. We all know these examples that have been debated in the literature. Um, yesterday I rest, rested. It's extremely hard to, this is the object marker appearing. I'm not even calling it here an object marker. I'm just putting raw as the gloss. Um, and it, it is appearing on yesterday. Um, in it's We are hard pressed to analyze that as an object, but uh, um, uh, nevertheless, it's appearing on it. Um, this is another example. Again, depending on your syntactic theory, you might consider um, um, the all the way as an object of running or not, but it's kind of the stretch. So it's it's the the generalization is going to leak if students are trying to find objects and put raw on it. They probably would not pick um, these items to put raw on, but um, you can. Um, and that's tricky. Um, then the uh, the second rule said the word must be definite or specific, not general. But in fact, actually, there is literature on raw appearing on, on generics. Um, so here, water dissolves salt. In fact, um, as far as I know, it's obligatory here on salt. Um, so you can't drop it. And the meaning here is not that water is dissolving a particular salt, a specific or definite salt. This is Generally speaking, it dissolves salt. Um, it is another example. Suppose you want to say read any book you want. Uh, um, again, uh, you can have the object mark here. The object marker is optional, actually. Um, but uh, definitely, the idea is not the speaker telling the addressee to read a very specific book. Um, in fact, it's the opposite. Um, it's up to the addressee to pick a book and read. So it becomes very tricky to know what specific really means um, when we're talking about object marking. Then the uh, other rule, it must not be preceded by preposition. It really sounds correct. Typically, you wouldn't accept in these examples where it does I mean, actually appearing on a prepositional phrase. So I cleaned the inside of the car. In fact, it's obligatory. You can't drop it. You got to have it on in, inside of the car. Um, and it appears right after a preposition, and you got to have it. Uh, or uh, I walk to school. Um, this one is optional. Um, uh, but uh, again, this is appearing after a preposition. Um, now, how can we reduce the marking leaks? This is quite hard because the theories of object marking have become more and more abstract. Um, but something that seems to be at the core of it, and I will present an example that I think better illust illustrates how um, the object marker semantics at least works, um, is that um, the case marking seems to signal that the speaker has assumed the nominal to exist in the discourse, um, let's say, um, in the discourse. Um, for, uh, here is an example to uh, illustrate it. Um, this is a proper name, let's assume there is a proper name called Sam Bahrami. And um, the question is, do you know Sam Bahrami? And typically here, I would say, I when I started doing research on the object marking and case marking, I thought, absolutely obligatory. You got to have the object marker here. You can't drop it. To my surprise, you can absolutely drop it. <laughs> and it makes sense when you drop it. It means, do you... In English, the translation would be, do you know a Sam Bahrami, which does not presuppose the existence of this person. So here, I think, is one of those uh, uh, special contexts in which the role of the object marking becomes um, abundantly clear. Um, it is signaling, I, as the speaker, am signaling to the addressee that I have assumed the existence of this person with the name. I'm not asking the question about that. I'm asking, do you know the person I know exists? The second one, it lets um, Sam Bahrami to be part of the question. I'm ask actually asking, does this person exist in your um, knowledge of people? So um, I think examples like these could be called representative and inform maximally informative with respect to a marker. Um, here is an exercise from the book that I thought is extremely hard. I couldn't pass. Um, it says uh, translate uh, um, translate into Persian 
and um, then decide whether it takes the object marker or not. I think the first one was okay. I did well. Um, but then the second one, I bought him a drink. I did not know. I thought <laughs> you can put the object marker or not. It's kind of optional because typically the object marker is optional on a lot of indefinites. The same is true of I bought Susan a sandwich and a cake um, depends really um, are we talking about um, do, do we in the discourse um, context assume particular sandwiches and cakes if so yeah I can probably put it there if not then it would be tricky um, she ate the sandwich would be straightforward again so it even the exercises also get very hard because exactly um, of the mismatch between let's say the grammar that is presented and the uh, the complexity of the actual usage of uh, Persian speakers. Case study two, plurals. This is the story of the, uh, of the uh, plural marker, huh? Uh, Fatima and I are still working on it, but uh, some, it will present some things that we know. Um, so this is an example of teaching pluralization. The most common way to make a noun plural is by adding the suffix ha. Huh? Um, telephone, telefona, sagami, sagami, ha. Huh? Um, and um, another, um, Part of this is that with animate, that with inanimate nouns, the verb can take a singular form. I'm not going to go into that. For animate nouns, um, the book says that the suffix on is normally used in more formal contexts. Um, talking about pluraliz pluralization leaks, um, the most common way to make a noun plural is by adding the suffix ha, huh? sort of. Also common is not adding it and have a numeral and a classifier, which is quite common. Um, three books are on the table. Uh, takes no uh, plural marker. Notice that in English, in order to have the numeral three, you have to have the plural marker. In Persian, you don't have to have that. In fact, you just have, similar to some analytic languages, um, you have the nominal, you have the classifier, you have the uh, numeral. And you have also a special word of unknown numeral that acts like some and makes pluralization of in uh, kind of indefinites. Uh, quite easy. Some books are on the table. Um, maybe I'll go into it later, but I would want to point that we and a lot of people thought that, well, then this mechanism is a mechanism of pluralizing indefinites. That's actually wrong because you can say um, these three books in Setha Kitha, and then you have made it into definite. So um, Persian is kind of quite complex when it comes to definiteness and indefiniteness. Um, it has a very abstract way of making things definite and definite. I'm going to get, get into it. Um, the um, generalization also said that for animate nouns, the suffix on is normally used in more formal context. However, there are a lot of inanimates that take the suffix, suffix um, your view, the rafton, trees, words, plants, stars. Also, a lot of animals that don't take it. I don't think you can say marmulakon, uh, lizards, or maimunon, or monkeys. So these are the types of leaks you will have once um, you have these types of generalizations. Um, so how can we reduce it? And I really want to emphasize reducing it. It will still leak. <laughs> it will always leak. It's just about reducing the leak. Um, so Persian seems to have two different mechanisms of pluralization. Um, possibly remnants of kind of competing systems in the language. Uh, one is the numeral classifier noun phrase. This would be chanta bache, some number of kids, kind of ta does like quantification there. Um, and then noun plus plural marker that is bacha, uh, kids. They can also be combined, and this is the confusing part. Um, so the three books are on the table becomes seta, seta keta um, which kind of interesting. Um, the, it is not freely combinable. There are some constraints, and I'm going to go through that. Um, they, the two systems interact with the definiteness system of the language in intricate ways. So in English, if you want to say something like the books are on the table, um, you have both the definite marker and the plural marker. Um, in Persian, you can, you can just have the plural marker, kitab, and this has caused a lot of theoretical linguists to suggest that the um, plural marker is also a definite marker. Um, and it makes sense. It can't appear with the indefinite article. You can't say, um, that's pretty bad. Uh, but add the other indefinite marker, and it's great. Um, if you say, that is great. Some books are other on the table. Um, to me, that suggests at least that it is 
again, not the plural, plural marker carrying the definiteness, lexically encoding the definiteness, but rather something, some mechanism coming in and putting definiteness on top of what example one had. And we will see actually definiteness in Persian typically is a covert process. Um, after all the markers are done, then um, definiteness is decided. Now time to call, talk about case 33, indefinites um, um, and definites. So this is the story of yek and e. Um, this is the example of teaching indefiniteness. Generally, Persian does not distinguish between a car and the car, is that that's the generalization. Machine um, kharabe, machine darid. Uh, the point is that um, you can interpret that as the car, the car or a car. Persian does not distinguish it. Um, and the uh, book says the indi to indicate the indefinite, you can use yek or ye. Uh, and a less colloquial uh, form um, or more formal form would be e. Um, now, going um, to examples of the leak or at least reducing or kind of even also reducing the leak. Um, the main claim here is that Persian does not distinguish between a car and they car, but I kind of feel like, of course it does, um, using intonation. It's just that intonation is the type of thing we don't write down. Um, so the first, if you want to say the car is in the alley, um, you typically have a different intonation pattern than something like there is or cars in the alley. Um, in example one, um, you have a fall on the first word and a rise on the second part of the sentence, so machine to kuchas. The second sentence becomes machine to kuchas, which is an overall rise. And this is quite common in, in, in Persian. You use intonation to convey definiteness in a lot of um, scenarios. That system, intonational system, interacts with all the markers uh, that uh, kind of somehow encode, I wouldn't want to say definiteness, but things that are related to definite and indefinite concepts. You can also use the indefinite determiner ye, the, in, the indefinite clitic e, and this what is called what I want to call specificity marker uh, uh, um, So I'm going to go through some examples. If you want to say a car is in the alley, you can say ye machin to kuchas. If you want to say some car or other is in the alley, something like that, you can stack the indefinite uh, markers on top of each uh, on top of the noun um, and say ye machini to kuchas. Um, I would want to say that just having the indefinite clitic is no longer in the grammar of spoken or colloquial Persian. This is, um, at least in positive episodic environments, it can appear in questions, antecedent of conditionals, under negation. In short, the indefinite clitic E has turned into an NPI, uh, negative polarity item, um, and has a very restricted distribution, and it interacts in the um, kind of interesting ways. I've worked on it before, um, but the work is ongoing still. And finally, we have this colloquial, uh, sometimes I think incorrectly called the definite marker, e, machine to puchas. Um, I would like to emphasize it's not, in my book, at least definiteness marker, because you can say ye machine to puchas. It can co-occur with the indefinite article. Um, and in that situation, it makes it a specific indefinite um, in the true sense. So I would actually say that specificity is a loose term for the object marker raw, but a very, very proper term for this marker. It really does what a proper specificity marker has to do. Um, again, you, as you can see, the absence or presence of an indefinite article determines whether the nominal that the specificity marker is appearing on is a definite or an indefinite. Really, in Persian, is the absence-presence contrast. Um, so Persian, if you want to reduce the leaks, Persian does distinguish between definites and indefinites using a variety of tools. It's just a complex system. Intonation, the definite, uh, indefinite determiner, the indefinite clitic, the specificity marker, the case marker, so on, probably more. Um, the issue with Persian is that it doesn't have a morpheme that corresponds to a the. Instead, it uses a constellation of morphemes that together with intonation deliver the final effect. Um, for unknown reasons, actually, I don't, many languages do this, but it's, um, it's uh, kind of interesting to find out why is it that a lot of languages have these type of constellation morphemes. So these were the leaks and the kind of reducing the leak solution uh, solutions, but the leaks apply to the 
reduction, leak reduction uh, proposal as well. Uh, two solutions um, that I would um, that I could think of. One is to rely more on representative and informative data. So people who are like, you know what, this is too much work. We got to keep updating these grammars. Let let us just get rid of the grammars and instead have rich representative data that allows students to really do generalization. And I think that's a fine path to take. So we can rely on provision of data that is maximally informative and uh, uh, representative uh, and not uh, provide the grammatical generalizations, not have grammar lessons, et cetera, et cetera. But here is the catch. How do we know what data is more informative for learners or representative? You, know, you need to have a linguistic theory to know that i.e. grammar. So if you have the grammar, then you can also teach it if you want it. Um, so it doesn't kind of, you face the same issue. You can still not teach the grammar, but you have to use the grammar to find the, the representative and informative data for teaching. Um, um, I think that still requires closer collaborations, tighter theoretical pedagogical links, and by that, I just don't mean, hey, get together and have conferences. That is fine. What I mean really by that is that theoretical linguists are providing theories, let's say grammars and um, examples and databases that can be used for pedagogy. And then uh, second language acquisition researchers can go test the effectiveness of these in teaching, actually. Um, that would be the close ties uh, that um, I have in mind. Then another solution is to just keep updating the grammars and reduce the leak. We can cont continuously do this and um, update the instructional grammars that reflect the most accurate accounts available. Theoretical linguistics can focus on improving grammars, reducing the leaks, and provide the data that maximally informs learners. Language pedagogy and teaching can use the data grammars for theoretical linguistics and pair them with other pedag pedagogical components for testing. Notice that this is just number two on that list. So you can pair this up with different ways of assessment, um, let's say different ways of giving feedback, and then still you'll have different systems that need comparison in their effectiveness. Um, this also requires close ties and more collaborations among theoretical linguistics and researchers in second language acquisition teaching. So I think overall, I feel like um, there is no way out of this. Um, it would be probably really good to um, uh, invest in um, these closer ties and having systematic connections between theoretical uh, um, Persian linguistics and um, Persian language pedagogy. That is it, thank you. Excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you thank so you. much, Professor Thanks. Jaswi. I really enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody else did too. Um, so I'm just gonna like uh, usual, go through um, the main points that Professor Jaswi mentioned, and then I will um, open the floor for discussion and questions. Um, so um, he started with, um, saying that leaky grammar is actually um, originally introduced by Sapir. And uh, then he talked about explicit teaching of grammar versus implicit um, teaching um, of, of grammar and which one is preferred. Um, he talked about Sapir's idea who said that natural languages are um, somewhat irregular and hence we have, we have no choice but to have leaky grammar. And um, he talked about basic, basic components of language learning being linguistic data, linguistic behavior, which are assessed and evaluated by the teachers, and then eventually feedback is given. And very interestingly, he drew some um, comparisons with uh, machine learning, which I found very interesting. And um, then he talked about the teacher's role in all that. And, uh, he said the teacher can provide representative and informative data, um, can provide um, grammatical generalizations, can elicit linguistic behavior, can design target assessment, aiming at learning, of course, and then provide feedback. And then he said that um, uh, these five, the four out of these five, four of them are present in all teaching approaches, and one of them is more controversial, being providing um, uh, grammatical generalizations. And then um, he talked about um, by what do we mean by implicit versus explicit grammar instruction? Implicit being um, providing data or token-based, and it is less likely to lead to errors um, 
um, due to leaky grammar. And then explicit grammar teaching is providing rules and um, for sure it will introduce errors and biases to learners. And then he gave us three case studies. One of them was accusative case raw. Um, and then he gave some examples from some textbooks. Um, and um, he also introduced some um, solutions to that by how, how can we reduce the case uh, marking uh, leaks. And then the second case uh, study was uh, plural ha. And he also gave some um, um, solutions for reducing the pluralization leaks. And then um, finally, uh, the case study three was um, indefiniteness, that is the car, a car. And um, uh, so he said that, of course, we can reduce the definiteness leaks through different means. One of them is by intonation. And one is by, um, you know, uh, teaching them what specificity marker is, indefinite um, uh, in clitic is. And then he gave two solutions overall that we can um, rely more on representative and informative data. But then there is a problem that how do we know which data is more representative? And the second solution was update uh, grammars um, uh, and reduce leaks. And for both of these solutions, he said, we need to have more collaborations between second language, um, uh, second language acquisition specialists and pedagogues. And so this is overall what uh, Professor Jasri talked about. I would like to um, begin the question with the question that I had, and then I will take questions from the floor. So don't you think that proficiency level has a has a role here? That is, um, if you're dealing with the students in first year of Persian, probably the explicit uh, teaching would benefit them more, while in third year, implicit one um, will benefit more because um, well, I'm going to talk about this in my own lecture, um, in my own talk uh, in the fall, but uh, in the winter, but um, based on the uh, mental lexical, um, uh, you know, based, based on the processing and uh, mental lexicon ability of the of the learners, there is a there is a, let's say, stage at which we can introduce them certain kind of um, um, let's say grammatical knowledge or, or lexical knowledge. And then um, these generaliz ge generalizations, um, uh, actually they might work for lower proficiency because it gives them like the, you know, very quick uh, kind of handout while the exceptions or the leaky grammars, um, we can deal with them when the students are in higher levels. I mean, why should they know about all those, the three cases that you mentioned, especially the raw in the in the first year, why should they know that the ruzo esterahat kardam would also be possible? I mean, it can be held until they get to a to a level which, you know, they, they can actually grasp it, process it better. So, and then if you could answer this and then I will take questions. Yeah, I agree. I think that that would be a possibility that would be like a curriculum that says, hey, you don't have just uh, one grammar instruction. You have a class of grammars that increase in specificity um, as and then you you introduce the coarse grained ones at the beginning and then the very fine grained ones later. I think that could work. One issue is, and I think the hard task is with the second language acquisition researchers typically is that the effectiveness of all of these approaches need to be tested and it's extremely hard to have proper controlled experiments that shows this would work and it would not. So we actually try on a totally different note on our Ling One course here, I tried to test the effectiveness of, uh, of three approaches for reading comprehension last year and we're gonna do it again this year. It was an extremely hard task and the results were completely unexpected. There are too many factors, it's very hard. So um, I think these are all possibilities. My worry is that we don't know. We don't know how much each system would work, um, if increasing would help, if decreasing would help, if keeping it the same would help. All of these things, if, all of these should be tried out. Um, at this point, I would trust the intuitions of instructors. They have, they have the best data available because they've dealt with learners. Thank you so much. Okay. So now I'm taking questions. If you you can just raise your hand. Oh, okay. I can see that uh, Azita has a question. Azita, go ahead. 
Okay, I just wanted to just save my question for the end, but I said that perhaps uh, because of follow up of your question. Um, I, I think that what uh, Pune mentioned somehow, it's uh, something that we all uh, deal in uh, when we teach different level of languages. But uh, at the same time, it's uh, totally uh, related that how we plan uh, our um, uh, courses, you know, you know, the grammar, teaching grammar, because uh, uh, the, the problem that I found the different texts that I use textbook is that uh, some of them, they are not uh, good in how to organize and plan uh, the um, um, specific grammatical topic uh, step by step that the students get it. And then when you go to advanced level, you can talk about the, uh, you know, specific situation, for example, of raw or uh, indefinite and uh, so on. Um, my second uh, point that I wanted to ask you is that um, I agree with you that uh, linguists should uh, work with um, a second language, um, uh, Persian second language pedagogue and to go with, uh, um, you know, somehow better uh, grammar solution for teaching. But, you know, uh, even in linguists, your linguists, you know that there are still controversial about some topic that is problem in um, uh, Persian teaching. For example, Ezofe. We, we have many um, dissertation article about Ezofe. Still, uh, there is no specific solution that the linguists tell us that I, for example, that I am linguist, get uh, more information that I can use it when I want to write a grammar for second language um, students. Or for raw, we have different kinds of the opinion uh, about that. So my point is that if somebody wants to write the um, you know grammar based on you know we have in other languages too based on the linguistic, there are many uh, gaps still in um, linguistic uh, theory about these kinds of uh, issues that we have in uh, teaching, how we can write a grammar in this way, as long as we do not have any um, kind of compromising about a specific topic, like raw specific topic about SFA. So who gonna write there, who can be the, um, the last person to say that, okay, this is it, this is a uh, Zofe rule, this is raw rule, and now we go for writing a grammar that will be helpful for second language learner. Still linguist, linguists themselves, uh, they have many things uh, in controversy about these kinds of the topic. Yeah, I agree. I think that I would say, again, <laughs> that's why we need more collaborations among theoretical linguists. Uh, the reason is, the reason I say that say that is that a lot of fields have a controversy. So, for example, but it doesn't mean they don't have consensus. There is a lot of consensus. The issue is a field should be the mechanism I see within a scientific field is that you establish different agreed upon, let's say, uh, analyses or facts to this to explain, and then you move on. Linguists is kind of a more of a new field, so it hasn't been good at doing that, especially some subfields but if you look at other fields that's what they do because at the end the society has to go use that knowledge you can't keep saying oh according to this other theory so i think theoretical linguists have to get together and say okay if they if someone is buying your work what is it what is your consensus it's okay you can change it later but you got to give me something right now and i think the push from language pedagogy can also help theoretical linguists uh, be more systematic about this Okay, thank you. Matthew. Like I would say, for example, to just give you an example, raw seems the object marker account seem very like all over the place, different accounts. But in my experience, it's not actually. Most people are saying pretty much the same thing. It's just in different languages and with my like tiny differences. Um, when I was writing it up, I just thought I'm just confirming other people and just putting it in maybe more formal terms. So that is to me ready to be um, deployed as some some consensus on it with some representative and informative data that can be used for teaching but we got to do it theoretical linguists got to do it i hope so we are waiting for that you got to push us you got to be like hey we what are you selling us you got to sell us something <laughs> okay thank you Masu. thank you Masu. now nahal and then goes there and then miguel Salam. Hi, thank you so much for this um, interesting presentation. I think I come to it from the language, second language uh, teaching and learning perspective. 
And a few thoughts that I, I had were, um, first of all, I don't see the either or. I don't see why we need to pick whether to teach explicitly or implicitly or combine them and use resources um, as needed and as we go on in the process of um, teaching. I think the way, if we look at it that way, then it will be less problematic and we more an issue of what's the best resource at what point in um, in teaching. Also, um, another perspective to bring is, is in, to bring in is the social aspect or sociolinguistic aspect of language learning. When um, true, there's a brain that processes um, data in a certain way, but there's also interaction. People negotiate. People talk all the time, and I don't think, at least in my um, view of um, teaching. We're not looking for an ideal speaker who does not have errors. We're looking for somebody who, if hears a raw and is not exactly clear why it was, it was used, they ask for clarification. That can happen between native speakers all the time, right? So if somebody says, there might be a question that you know asks for clarification to make sure that they know what's going on. Anyway, so my ideal language learner is somebody who's able to negotiate confusions that might, because grammar becomes very important when it, when meaning gets across, right? I mean, that, that should be one way of looking at it, at, at least, that you want to get meaning across, you want to communicate, that's our ultimate goal, but grammar has a role in it. Grammar becomes important in that communication. So that's where, in some of the approaches to language teaching, noticing becomes important. In other words, you don't say, I don't teach grammar, but if there are situations in the learning process, in the teaching process, where learners notice something and they say, wait a second, are we, did they say raw here? Did they say raw? Did I hear that? That's when you try to bring in the grammar and to teach the grammar. I think that takes me back to the point that Hune was also mentioning. To me, if learners in that first year Persian get exposed to all of these different, you know, the leaky part or the very clear and um, explicit, you know, this is how you use raw. If they are exposed to it and they don't notice it, then we don't teach it. We, we can ignore it at that point, but they need the information that you were saying. You were saying data and information is one important source that you need to expose your learners to, right? But depending on their proficiency, depending on the situation, depending on what context we have and what meaning is getting across, they may notice a grammatical point. And that's where I think, again, another thing that comes in is the active learner. The learner can think about this and can ask questions and say, wait a second, I thought draw is used this way. Then you can talk about all these irregularities and the leakiness and bring in the grammar. So I think this is great information, but to me, there's no either or, and there's no, no problem to solve, basically. I would love the idea of more interaction and more working together because it will just help us think of these as different resources that we bring into the language learning process. And of course, bring the social um, aspect into it. So I thought I would ask you what your thoughts are on that and um, how you see the, what, what role do you see for the learner in this whole process? Thanks so much. Thank you. These are really good points. I'd say I really want it in, in, in one version of there is a there is an alternate universe in which I give this talk and I say there is no either or we should do both and I wanted to do that. There is one thing that stopped me from doing uh, we should do both. It's not either or. Um, there are two things. One is I have been looking through experimental literature to see if conclusively a study can show that over and above representation of informative data, the instruction of the grammar has helped learners. There have been many, and I cited them, a lot of studies that are saying, hey, the explicit instructional approach helped. The issue is all of those differ on all those five components. They are comparing two different approaches and say like maybe form, let's say form focused uh, instruction helps or not. Um, what we need is keeping all the components the same and only vary the the gram grammar instruction and see how that affects the learning process. And as you said, level of proficiency might be a factor, uh, active learning might be a component. It might interact with all of these. So unless we work, so going back to your active learning and connecting your active learning comments to this, it's possible with more active learning 
explicit instruction becomes less important. And I want to, uh, another, the second thing that stopped me from saying, oh, these must both happen, is the history of machine learning, the way it happened. Um, at the beginning, there was a lot of explicit engineering into machine learning systems. Um, this turned out to do exactly um, what I was talking about, error introduction from the uh, from putting explicit rules into the systems. The reason a lot of these current um, AI systems are doing really well was to not do that, unleash good, I mean, in this case, they're not even doing good representative data. They're just like throwing billions and billions of tokens at them and let them figure out. Um, once that happened and the kind of essentially engineering stopped, the systems improved rapidly. So there are, I'm pretty sure there will be people within the community that would argue, you know what, you don't need that. You need active learning, as you said, you need it to be social. You need to put the learner in the position of asking questions and testing hypotheses. I assume a lot of first language uh, acquisition researchers would join because they would say that's what a kid does. A kid really is exploring the environment, getting their own data actively to figure out the structure of language. So it's possible for it to be an either or. I don't think it has to be at this point. But that distant picture of, you know, actually turned out we didn't even need, if we had good representative data, good active learning with social interaction in the class, you didn't even need, you let the learner figure out the hypothesis on their own. Did that address the um, issues? And I agree with active learning. That's like one of the main, let's say, components of first language acquisition. I would be very surprised it's not, if it's not in second language acquisition. Thank you so much. Just uh, to add something, I, I'm not sure which textbook or which grammar book your your um, your examples came from, but most of the right. textbooks that are written for Persian, if they give a rule, that there, there is always followed or preceded by examples, examples. like a text, a dialogue, a, a reading, or you know. So I think um, I think subconsciously, or maybe people who have written textbooks due to experience. Um, Professor Hillman can can correct me or can jump here and um, uh, add uh, what he thinks about it. But when you write a textbook, I mean, you you think about the learners, obviously, and then it's not only the explicit um, grammar in your mind that is enough, but also the text that you give. So yeah. it's it's the latter, um, the later, let's say, um, proficiency levels, which you which is more, um, let's say. I don't know, concerning whether explicit teaching of grammar is necessary yep. or not. But for the lower levels, of course, both of them are combined, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, that's why I phrased it as over and above, because you always have implicit learning. No one says, like, here are the rules, go generate the language. That doesn't <laughs> happen. You have to have data, always. Exactly. Thank you so much. Yes, Gurzde. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this has been a fascinating talk. Um, as a uh, language, um, as a linguist slash cognitive scientist and a language teacher, um, the topics of explicit grammar and how to deal with irregularities in grammar are topics that I think about quite a lot. So this was very much relevant. Um, so I, I put both hats, the linguist set and the language teacher set, like Azita and um, presumably <laughs> others in the um, audience as well. Um, so I completely agree with the um, idea that there should be more um, close mutual um, communication between um, theoretical linguists and uh, people working on uh, pedagogy and teachers. Um, I, I, I believe that the um, challenge here that we have um, in the language classroom is um, our limitations. Okay, we only have four hours per week given in a classroom, language being taught in a non immersive, unnaturalistic environment. Um, but we also have our strengths, like the learners having already um, have reached a certain cognitive um, level. Presumably, again, having one or more existing grammars may help or hinder anyway. Um, but it is there are differences from 
um, naturalistic language acquisition, the process that a child goes through. And also there are, again, presumably differences between AI and machine learning in terms of the structure of the processor. Um, so what I would like to um, hopefully hear from you about is how um, you think that implicit um, grammar teaching would um, help with the issue. Because um, as far as I see it, even if we don't teach the grammar explicitly and give implicit, um, give grammar implicitly, the learner will still need to um, come to the um, internal representation of grammar somehow, if, if you accept the idea of representations overall, through their own um, self-discoveries. And I believe they would still go through the same challenge upon encountering um, counterexamples, which may even make it a little bit harder through uh, the process, it seems to me. So how do you think really implicit grammar per se would help? And I completely agree again, grammars implicitly or explicitly taught are only as good as um, the linguistic theory that lies uh, behind it. So um, what, what what is your opinion on this? Thank you. Great question. So I want to emphasize that what I mean by like more collaboration is not just like talking more. Uh, maybe I should just give like two concrete versions of it that um, I can think of. One is it's becoming more and more common to collaborate on these kind of like mega online textbooks where it's constantly updated. It's online and has like 20 authors or something that work on different aspects collaboratively. I mean, that could be an example where a kind of like mega textbook comes up uh, that um, has different people working on different components of it, for example, if also different parts of the grammar, um, how the data is selected, how the assessment should be done, different experts on, for example, assess assessment versus grammar instruction coming in. Um, that would be one version of it. Another would be, again, having conferences that require theoretical linguists to present language pedagogy relevant work so that, again, can be applied, et cetera, et cetera. So it should be very specific, not just like more talking. Um, with respect to um, your question regarding the implicit versus explicit teaching, I think, again, as I said, implicit teaching is always happening. All classes have examples. Learner comes up with um, possible generalizations in their heads, and they kind of stick with them to some degree. Um, the version that I think, so there are two things we can do. Um, not all examples or data are equal in terms of elucidating possible grammars that the learner can uh, in, induce from the data. Some set of examples are better, and this is where the teacher pedagogy comes in to give the examples that best separate grammars. Um, then there's also examples that are truly irregularities of a language and have to be presented as they are. This needs a systematic approach where kind of the rules and kind of exceptions type of thing is balanced. Um, and then here, I think explicit instruction can really shine where the rules are regular and uh, applicable. The learner might need to see a lot of examples, but the explicit teaching can really shortcut that. So together with like really good data, shortcutting where you can, not shortcutting obviously when there are exceptions, you can really just shorten the amount of time and effort that the learner has to have um, for learning. And I guess that would be the ultimate goal, just make it easier for learners to learn it and then more quickly. Yeah, if I may just follow up very quickly yeah. on, on that. Um, I should have mentioned before, I uh, teach Turkish, um, which is a language that is, I believe, quite suitable for uh, explicit yeah. grammar teaching, which I also intentionally do. And I have my reasons that I can talk mm -hmm. about uh, for a long, long time. But uh, yeah, that was what I was thinking. Like, as part of explicit grammar, we can actually, again, give the caveats that okay, this is the rule, but there are many, these they are the instances where you see the rule leaking to the students um, as yeah. a solution. Because um, the opposite, like implicit um, grammar teaching, again, is in a way throwing the learner out in the wild with them 
messy data, which it is. Um, so yeah, but thank you yep. so much again. It's wonderful. Yeah. To just add something with irregularities, not all irregularities are the same. Some are even a lot more. So if for yeah, one absolutely. easy thing to do is like do a, uh, we can do a corpus search and find out irregularities that are extremely common. Once you teach those, that's a, that's a step ahead. And then they can go see the ones that are quite rare in the wild maybe, yeah. but we have covered a lot of super useful common ones in the class. So that can help. Mm -hmm. These are like tricks to like really just make the process go faster. Absolutely, because at first, what first came to my mind was you know the English past tense ed versus the caught and the examples like those, which are the more regular irregularities in a way. But exactly, your examples are different. I see. Thank you. Thank you so much, okay. um, Professor Just we Just uh, you mentioned there is there are some mega textbooks. Do you have any examples of them? This is very common in, um, I'm going to go search and find uh, and bring them to you. There is one in logic uh, called Logic in, Act in Action, uh, which is a logic textbook. Um, if In fact, if you go to logicinaction.org, uh, I think you'll see it. This is done by a lot of logicians, um, some of them at, at Amsterdam, some of them at Stanford, some of them at Berkeley. Um, this is a mega textbook of different people covering different chapters and different sections that are their specialty, trying to do a new way of teaching logic that is relevant to everyday life. Um, mm -hmm. Again, okay. it just goes on forever and these mm -hmm. it lives online as a free resource. So it requires um, effort and collaboration um, and constant update, but it's it's been the source for a lot of the courses uh, I and others teach in logic. Um, Do you know the same is any? true of statistics. Do you know of any language? mega textbook there is an introduction i recently learned about an introduction to a linguistics textbook that is an open access textbook online i can i can go back and find i did it was just recent and i forgot about it. The okay resources. i'll, I'll but, email you okay yeah thank you I think something like that can exist for um persian language pedagogy yes ideally thank and you and multimodal because these days you can with online textbooks um provide multimodal instruction yeah, certainly. Miguel, you're next, and then Professor Hillman is second. Thank you very much. Going back to the concept of regularity, irregularity, grammaticality, and so on, do you think it would be relevant to make a distinction between ungrammaticality, exception, and archaism? Because things that sometimes we consider ungrammatical or exceptions are indeed not ungrammatical and not exceptions are actually older stages of the language. So what role do you think historical linguistics could play in explaining mm -hmm. these things, also for the teaching method, for the pedagogy of it? Thank you. That's a very good question. I had not um, thought about it before. I think teaching on grammaticality is like a real challenge, exactly because you mentioned you don't want to teach something as ungrammatical that is grammatical. <laughs> um, one thing that, one idea I can share that might help um, the discussion is um, Adele Goldberg and others have worked on this idea of um, preemption as on grammaticality, which is using conventional forms, establishing conventional forms repeatedly for a particular function or meaning renders alternative ways as uh, ungrammatical. So you haven't heard the ungrammatical ever you have just inferred it because you know a construction that strongly conveys that meaning. So you would assume the one that you didn't hear for the same meaning is just not grammatical. So one way to teach, and they've done experiments to show this, um, one way to teach on grammaticality could be uh, just teaching, establishing particular constructions quite strongly uh, so that people know the alternate, the other way. So in my, Slides, I think the example would be establishing that ye kitaba is not a thing, chanta kitab or chanta kitaba is a thing. That kind of comparison might allow the learner to know, oh, for the same meaning, I have another construction. I don't need to combine this indefinite marker with the plural. Um, but the role of historical linguistics, I haven't really thought about that I would love to know more if you have thoughts on how historical linguistics can, linguistics can inform it I would love to 
and incorporate it. In my concrete case, I'm teaching the older stages. I'm teaching all the Middle Iranian languages. Mm -hmm. And I talk many times with Azita about these things and also with my students when some of these problems that, of course, are often found in modern Persian appear to them and they think, I don't really understand that. And I tell them, but this goes back to that concrete part right. of Middle Persian. And then they start understanding a little bit more. Of course, not everything, because still there will be a lot of problems that would remain unsolved. But some others mm -hmm. that can be, I would say, more easily explained when you know where they go back to. It's like, for instance, in other languages, it would be the same. If you tell them in English, food and feet, mm -hmm. feet is an irregularity. It's not actually an irregularity. It's just an older stage of the language that had another procedure to create a plural, going back to Proto-Indo-European and all this stuff. But when you tell them even very briefly that this is not actually ungrammatical, but just an archaism, and you tell them very briefly where it might go back to, it makes sense to them much faster. So I think this, in some cases, of course, not in all of them might help, but of course it depends on the or many other things. It's not just something you can apply always, of course. But yeah. Totally agreed. I think a lot of language learners are often frustrated with why is it this way? And historical linguistics gives good answers. <laughs> that would at sometimes, least sometimes at least. Help, sometimes. Help, yeah, sometimes at least helps people have more peace of mind. <laughs> oh, that's Thank why. Historically. Thank you. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Professor Hillman, you're next. Yes, yeah, so I have a question about uh communicative environment. When I learned Persian, uh, no English was part of the learning. Uh, of course, the teachers didn't know they were teaching. They were the people on the streets in Mashhad. Uh, when I taught English at uh, the Iran American Society uh, in Mashhad, uh, no Persian uh, was heard in class. Uh, when I have taught um, Persian to American government uh, personnel, uh, no English is in class. When I've taught Persian grammar, I've taught Persian grammar in Persian, which means two things. One, students would have to know something about grammar in general, which they don't, unless they're from the 1940s and learned how to diagram sentences in the third grade. Uh, and second, it means it will be uh, at an upper level. Is communicative environment no longer a desideratum in interaction in class, because if you're going to teach grammar explicitly in a class to students who don't know grammar in general, uh, you're probably going to do it in English. Yeah, um, I would say this is if I want to put my implicit um, teaching hat on and be like, hey, let's go implicit teaching all the way through. I think I would argue that um, I would argue that which is like early if we add, and it goes back to, I think, Nahal's point, which was, if you add communicative interaction in class, if you add active participation of students, the social interaction, selected data, for example, let's just bring something from the child language acquisition literature, we have known for a while that children are not really engaged in all acts of, let's say, linguistic interaction in their environment. They are engaged with the things that they find interesting and is appropriate for them to learn at that moment. It's, it could be like getting the food at the breakfast table. It could be the kind of playing with the toys, etc. And they build up from those environments where the interaction is clear. So it's very like it's a simple game, pass the ball, right? It happens 200 times and they learn so much about the vocabulary of that context because the context is clear. I want you to pass the ball to me. I'll pass the ball to you. There is the meaning is transparent and then you can add forms on top of that. So if someone wanted to really bottom up, uh, build that type of thing where students are immersed in an environment that is engineered, and I assume um, that's what um, most teachers do in a second language acquisition environment. They are tailoring the conversation early on. Definitely no one goes in talking about Plato, let's say, in English or Persian teaching to uh, uh, learners, beginners. Um, so they, th you tailor the data, the interaction, the social environment in a way that they kind of build it up without explicit instruction. Then some people at that point might argue, do you really need the explicit instruction as higher up uh, in, in the pedagogy or not? 
I think all of these are things too. I would love, to, um, uh, I don't know what Fatima thinks, but in the future, we would love to experimentally test those and see it, can we dem demonstrate um, beyond doubt that uh, explicit instruction has bought the learner at the beginning uh, stages, which then you have to switch to the language they know, uh, or further along um, has benefits that is established and you can't uh, uh, let go of. I think a lot of people believe that. I am willing to believe that. It's just that I don't have a horse in the race. If it turns out that's the case, I'd be happy to accept it. If not, then we know we should invest probably more in interaction, um, immersion, proper data, all that, and that we gain more if we do that. I just don't know the answer. I don't know if, you, uh, Michael, you have a, it seems like you are more on the uh, implicit instruction side on that debate. But we're not uh, discovering something new. Remember the audio lingual approach, which replaced the grammar translation approach. And mm -hmm. for some years, even at universities from Michigan down to Texas and into California, uh, classes just went with uh, group, individual, repetition, uh, question, answer, transformation drill, substitution drill, that sort of thing. And it worked as people did learn, uh, you people who know something about theory and know how to analyze uh, the efficiency of approaches, uh, that that's uh, an important uh, ingredient. Uh, but it's just a question that is, uh, uh, and it ha I think it also has something to do with uh, the feeling that I've always gotten that this, from second year to third year, I never found anybody who got from second to your second year to third year, which would be like upper division French literature, if it was in a French department, without doing lots of stuff outside of class. In in the language of instruction, they were they were just kind of fluent enough to do things outside of class. Well, they. Uh, for some reason, or they were good in a particular school. That's I mentioned the government uh, crowd because the government learners are, have a very specific goal in learning to mm -hmm. read certain kinds of stuff and to listen to certain kinds of stuff. You don't have to worry about anything else. Mm -hmm. And you can prove as you go along that they're uh, accomplishing the tasks. Right. With These are with no grammar instruction to the government. Remember, in my generation, the... Persian language teachers at American universities were people who were told they were in, they were philologists or they were professional orientals or they were literary criticism. And they told, by the way, you're doing first year Persian too, if we give you mm -hmm. a job. And you say, okay. And it wasn't until uh, the mid 1970s where experts who were trained in teaching and teaching language got involved in it. But anyway, mm -hmm. I've uh, communicative environment is, has always been interesting to me. It's, one of you mentioned that uh, the problem is you've only got the four hours a week or the five hours a week. That is, if you had a semi-intensive or intensive environment, it would be a different story. Thank you so much. Um, Guzde mentioned something probably helps uh, the discussion a little bit too. She said that there is a recent tendency toward plurilingualism in the classroom, making it the best of existing languages, making the best of the existing languages of learners in a classroom. And uh, yes, that's true. So with that, I'm going to take the last uh, question from Sima because it's 1223 and we have to finish in seven minutes. Sima. Yes, hello to everyone, and thank you for a very um, interesting and uh, thought provoking uh, discussion. I really enjoyed it. But I want to uh, refer back to what Miguel said about the historical aspects of uh, of the language. We know that this is we know that Persian is very unique because of its very long history and also because of its diversity. So. Uh, so my experience of uh, seven years of teaching uh, Persians with different uh, people from different backgrounds, um, mostly the uh, when there was an irregularity, tracing it back to like Middle Persian or even older stages, at least provided some logical explanations for these irregularities, uh, not makes it any easier to, to include it in a grammar, but at least have some explanation why it behaves differently, like different 
forms of to be, uh, verb to be for past, present, and like negative. But then I want to add another aspect that I think it's important to notice when we are teaching, because most of us are teaching the Tehrani version of Persian. You know, the modern Persian is mostly the Tehrani version. And considering that Tehran is a melting pot of all varieties of Persian, so we see that uh, some of these behaviors of the language may refer to some behavior of like people whose mother tongue was like Eastern Iranian or Western Iranian. So they all brought their own uh, like a spice of the language into this melting pot. And then uh, and we see that this happening every day, you know, like. So I th I'm sure all of you have noticed that nowadays the younger generation, it's, it's a relatively new um, behavior that people, instead of uh, using malema for profession, they say wasema. And this, you know, differences that they receive, we observe every day, they may be ignited by a TV series or, you know, just a behavior, a linguistic behavior of a certain group that becomes popular or a rap musician, a, a singer or something. So uh, I think all of this, uh, just I wanted to mention that they, the reason for all these regularities or leaking problems, uh, maybe we should have a broader um, you know, observation of the historical and different diversities of Persian, but uh, it doesn't make writing the grammar any easier, but at least it may provide some logical explanation. That was just a few thoughts that I wanted to share. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree. I would add uh, that something that I think is a major problem in Iranian linguistics generally, and that is the <laughs> dominance of formal and Kitabi Persian. Uh, I can, it's, it's very interesting. The number of articles, including myself making that mistake, being like, I study Tehrani colloquial Persian and then go on <laughs> three paragraphs down. There are five examples that they are all mixing the varieties. Not only they are on the formal varieties, some of them, some of them are mixing them. One word is the informal one, one word is the formal one. The reason is, um, I think all Persian speakers are bilingual. The, the, they know the formal variety, which is not a natural variety. You don't, as a kid, grow up learning this. You went to school and <laughs> learned it. Um, and as a result, in the context of writing, especially people naturally switch. It's very hard to write. It's becoming easier because of texting and all that, but it's very hard to keep the um, informal uh, variety in writing. So a lot of, I think, theoretical literature is not really of one variety, like the spoken or formal, it's a mix. Um, and one task ahead of us is to really separate those. Um, the textbook that I mentioned, that I showed you, focuses on the formal variety. Throughout the textbook, there are a lot of, so it, it, it focuses on the informal variety, but throughout the textbook, there are so many examples of formal variety just seeping in without even, I don't notice it sometimes because of the fact that we keep switching between these two. So I think that is a major issue for theoretical work to make sure the systems are separated because I think they are separate systems with separate grammars. Um, and on the teaching side, it becomes very challenging because at the end, also you want maybe the uh, learners to know both because they got to read newspapers also. And um, so you got to teach two languages that are kind of interlinked, extremely tough task. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, the, the problem is that we have to teach two modes of language simultaneously spoken and like uh, the, the previous generation that Professor uh, Ilman just mentioned, uh, they never, they, they shouldn't be bothered about teaching spoken version. It was like vocationally and it was, and the other problem I think that we, we should consider three dimensions in Persian. It's not a difference between spoken and non-spoken. I never say written because nowadays we, we write the spoken language. So it's not a difference between spoken mm -hmm. and written, but exactly. spoken and non-spoken. The non-spoken version, you never hear that. You never hear somebody says, Mi Guyam. But then, 
then we have another dimension with, between formal and informal. We have a spoken formal and non. And then the major problem for a non, I mean, for a foreign students is that when we, we don't have, you know, still for for Persian language, the standard, you know, to check the grammar or not is the, our poetry, our classical Persian, which has another, it's another world. Huh? So yep. that's the challenge, you know, if you want to, whether it's grammatical or not, what maybe it doesn't follow a certain rule of, you know, today's ground, but then you can bring an example from a poem, which is perfectly, you know, yeah. pure, beautiful Persian. So that adds another complexity. Adds another aspect. Teaching. Yeah. Yeah, I have seen you. I have seen papers where the counterexample is a poem from Sadi. <laughs> I'm like, well, that is very different. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Professor Jasvi. I think uh, I will give the floor to Azita to uh, have a, to give the closing remarks. You know, uh, Pune, it's very difficult to cl uh, close this session because I think that we are all ready to continue this discussion. But uh, we understand that um, the Fenestry is uh, uh, Easter weekend. We do not want to take uh, um, uh, our audience's time. And specifically, our speaker with a wonderful job that he has done uh, for uh, this, um, engaging, so uh, engaging lecture and also very insightful, very informative. But I just want to tell you that um, uh, what you are uh, you have done uh, this uh, um, in this lecture, uh, maybe we continue next month because my point is very close to what you mentioned, but just just focus in my lecture in uh, just raw and the challenges that my students in the last twenty years had with learning law and the challenges that I had to teach them. Uh, this is something that I hope that we will see you again next month for the last uh, lecture that um, we have on uh, uh, Persian uh, language uh, pedagogy, and then we will continue in uh, fall. But for now, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to our speaker and uh, thanks to all audiences for this engaging discussion and thanks to our moderator, uh, Pune, for uh, this wonderful job that he has done and uh, say uh, so long uh, until uh, next month, May 13th, that we will see you again for the last uh, um, uh, talk on uh, Persian Second Language Pedagogy. Have a wonderful weekend and happy Easter. Thanks so much for having me, bye.